Good morning, everybody. Let's start our worship service, and um, we are going to do that uh, by listening the prelude. Please use this time to pray and to bring your heart before the Lord and um, talk with Him. Please stand up to read the scripture and open your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. The word of God says this, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, 
not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his work, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love because we recognize that we are sinners and that we were dead before your presence. But you gave us life again through your son, Jesus Christ. We fully understand that it was not because of our works, but because of your grace and mercy. And because of the faith we have in your son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. Only you are worthy to receive all the honor and the glory forever and ever. We are really grateful to you. Amen. Please remain standing. morning. It's great to see you today. I hope you've come to worship and praise the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, um, the King of the Nations. So let's sing. May it be from our mouth, but also from our heart as we worship our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to start with our th theme song for this time. I love to tell the story. I hope that by the end we will know it by heart. We won't need the words.
Bible said that with says that with faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And a lot of the Christian life has to do with faith. In fact, everything. By faith we see the hand of God. Faith is the substance of the things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. By faith, this mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall
of the nations. the only God because yours is the kingdom the power and the glory we thank you Lord then in your wonderful being and in your awesome glory you have chosen to love us first and you have chosen to save us and you have chosen to know us and you have chosen to redeem our soul from destruction and we just want to thank you for that oh God we know we are sinners and we confess that we have sinned before you. We ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you forgive our sin and that you empower us and help us to live dying to ourselves every day and living to you, living the life, the holy life that you want. We can't do it alone, Lord, and we thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to help us. Oh, God, we would be so lost without you. We just thank you for being with us for who you are thank you for loving us in spite of who we are thank you for making us heirs with you and we come to you in the name of Jesus the king of the nations the one who sits on the throne Jesus we just want to thank
Bible says where there are two or three united in his name, he is here in our midst today. So I invite you today to sing to him and say, Jesus, I just want to thank you. Don't sing to the air. God is here. Jesus promises the Lord that he is with us. So I invite you to open the eyes of faith and see him and sing to him. Let's not, this, let's not make this just one more song. Let's really, really Praise him and thank him because he is right here with us for what he has done and what he will do. Savior, we just want to serve you. and girls down here. All you precious ones, come on. Come on down. Come on right here. Get right here. There you go. Y'all have to get where you can see because I'm going to show you a book. I'm going to show you a book here, okay? Come on down. We got any more boys and girls? All right, come on, come on down. We got them, we got them coming, come on. Come on down. Now, see if y'all can work in your way over here. Come on, come on down. Look over here, come over here, come through here. Yeah, come through here. Now get over here. Y'all got to see the book so you can't. Hey, come on down, come on down. And you, hey, move down a little bit. Let, let the, hey, yeah, come on through here. Hey, come on down here, guys. Yeah, there you go. Come over here. There you go. And everybody, will everybody be able to see me? I'm going to show you a, a picture and then I'm going to read what it says. Okay? Have y'all got that? So, here is the picture. You see the picture? A lot of blue there, isn't it? So let's see what it says. The creation with sweeping brush strokes 
God painted His creation across the emptiness. Let there be light. He called into the darkness, and a sweep of brightness blazed across the blank canvas. He called the light what? Day. Day. That's right. Day. And the darkness he called what? Night. Night. Hey, (laughs) y'all do better than your parents. (laughs) This was day one. So he created what? Day and night. On day two, God called out into the light, let there be space between the water and above the water below. And he called the big blue area, what did he call it? Sky. Somebody's been reading to you, I can tell. Let the water gather in one place so land will appear. God commanded on day three, and it was so. And all right. Let's look at the next one. Look at this. Look at this. Look at that. Let's see what it says. Then God said, Let the land produce plants and trees bearing fruit, and the sweet smell of lilacs and apple blossoms fill the air. On day four, God said, Let the sun shine on the earth to mark the day and let the moon, the sparkling stars, mark the night. And it happened. Then on day five, God said, let creatures fill the oceans and rivers and lakes and the streams. Let birds fly high in the sky and sunfish and porpoises splashed in the waves while eagles and robins soared above them. Can you see the uh, fish and all that? Can you see all that in there? You see that? You see that? Okay, on the sixth day, God said, let living creatures roam the earth, and animals of every shape and size and color appeared. Then God, what, was, what are some of your favorite animals? What's one of your favorite, what? Huh? A what? Chameleon? A lizard? Oh, okay, well, okay. Do you have one for a pet? You do? What's, what's your favorite? An elephant. Huh? Polar bear? What? Octopus. A giraffe. Okay. Well, there's a giraffe right here. There's a giraffe right there. Look there. Okay. On the sixth day, God let living creatures roam the earth and animals of every shape and color appear. Then God stepped back, pleased with his creation, And it was all very good. But something was missing. God made the earth, just a minute, the sky and everything in it. But this was not God's entire plan. He was not finished. The best was yet to come. What did he need to create? Man. Man. Wow. You're good. I think you need to read this. Look at this. Here we go. Here we go. You see that? There's a giraffe on that, for sure. That's a big giraffe. All right, listen to this. On this same day, God did his finest work. He created people in his own image. God created a man, Adam, and a woman named Eve. He now had a part of creation that he could have a close and loving relationship with. Then God stepped back, took a look, and said, this is very, very good. You are my greatest creation, God says to us. Looking at you is better than looking at an ocean view. Watching you run and play is better than watching beautiful animals dart across the African plain. Seeing a smile on your face is better than seeing a sunrise. God says to us, you are my pride and joy. Isn't that good that we are? Let's thank God for his creation. We thank you, O Lord, that you created us. We are wonderfully and marvelously made. We thank you for loving us creating us 
for caring for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go to Kingdom Kids. Thank you for your wonderful attention. That, this uh, that I read from is from the children's story uh, written this way. And we are involved in that study and that uh, venture, that journey right now. But we want to welcome you. If you are guests today, you're visiting with us, we want to meet you. You're special. Now, all of you are special, but they are even more special, okay? Uh, because you have chose to worship with us today. Do we have any guests over here? We're all home folks. Anybody in the middle section? We have one guest. Yes, introduce your guest. Okay, Carlos. All right. Welcome. Welcome. We're glad to have you. Anybody else in the middle section? Anybody over here? We have guests. Sandra, you want to introduce, oh well, uh, okay, okay, welcome, welcome, and then we have this family here, welcome, we're glad to have you, anybody in the back back there, anybody in the back, nobody in the back, or are you just hiding, in the balcony, okay, those on higher ground, all right, Okay, let's do this. Let's stand up and greet one another in Jesus' name. Let's do that together. Okay, take your places, please. Take your places. Let me ask that uh, if you're visiting with us, that you fill out the little form that's in your bulletin to record your visit so we might know who you are. And let me say this. If you're not receiving uh, my devotional, which goes along with the story, it's, it's the story devotional book, you might want to put your name and uh, your email so we can place you on that. Did anybody read my devotional this morning? One, two, or three. I left out a word. And uh, it's my fault. I should have pre uh, pr proofread it. I uh, see, I'm bad about that. Uh, there was a strategic no left out. And uh, so if you go and, and read it today, find out where I left out the no, N-O, all right? So we are starting today the story. I read a little bit about the creation. The story that we looked at today uh, goes through the first eight chapters of Genesis. If you want to participate in that, we would encourage you to do so. Some have chosen to get the full impact of the story by coming at 9 o'clock. In fact, we had one family that got here at, at I mean, 9.30. We have one family that got here at 9 o'clock. Uh, they were ready to go. We watch a DVD. We engage in small group discussions. Now, those of you that have not chosen to do so or cannot do, you're going to get bits and pieces. I call it handfuls on purpose. You're going to get some of the story, but you're not going to get the full impact of the story. But today, we want to look at something specific that happened in this story. 
We begin with the creation. God said it was good. But then he says something else in Genesis 1.31. He says this, And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Not just good, but the whole of the creation was very good. I want us to move to the second chapter of Genesis. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Genesis 2? This story is of the first family. Now this is not the president's family. We refer to as the first family. This is the real first family. Adam and Eve. In many ways, it's different from other families in history. Why, they had no in-law problems. Adam didn't have to listen to Eve describe the other men she could have been married to. And Eve didn't have to listen to Adam to compare her cooking with his mother's cooking. Those can be points of contention at times. Mama used to make it like this. But we see here in this passage, beginning with verse 18, a marriage literally made in heaven. Look with me, chapter 2, verse 18, where it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good, that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. A marriage literally made in heaven. You see, God planned and designed a bride for Adam. In what ways, you may ask? What ways did he design a woman for Adam? Well, first of all, for companionship. The Bible says it's not good that man should be alone. The animals were not companionship for Adam, even though your little fluffy dogs and kittens are fun. That's not companionship. You see, there is a deeper fellowship, uh, one with a man and a woman. And there is no deeper fellowship than a Christian home where a husband and wife enjoy the things of God together. The happiest couples I have found throughout the years are those who are walking with God, serving God through their church, and enjoying the fruits of their labor. He created Eve for companionship, but he also uh, created Eve for cooperation. For cooperation. It says she was a helper, a helper. This is not a verb, it's a noun. Why? He didn't create her to pick fruit off the trees, even though she did. Why, he could get a man to do that. You see, she was created to help Adam reach his full potential to strengthen him. Cooperation. The next thing that God created Eve for was for completion. Fit means complete. We sometimes use the expression for our spouse as the other half or the better half. And this is exactly what God intended. Adam was like a violin without a bow. Eve was like him, but not the same. God wanted her to make up the part he was lacking. She was to be a completer, not a competitor. Did you get that? A completer, not a competitor. Ladies, you are to complete your husband, not to be in competition 
with him. God created a wife for Adam for companionship and for cooperation and for completion and also for communication. Look at verse 23 in this passage. It says this, Then man said, This is a bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She be, shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. A home is to communicate a truth. Man was to reflect the image of God. God, therefore, is not merely an additive to help marriage run smoothly. It is not our marriage, our home, our children. It is God's marriage, God's home, God's children. Do we know this? Or have we forgotten this? A home is to communicate a principle, and I want you to hear this very clearly. That is Christ and His church. It is to be an illustration of Christ and His bride, the church. Home is to be a small church. It is to reflect Christ and His church. But with too many marriages, it's far, far from that. It is not a reflection of Christ. It's not a reflection of the church. God planned a bride for Adam. He also, God provided, uh, God planned a bride for Adam. God provided a bride for Adam. Look in verses 19 and 20. It says this, Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever he call, man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. Now, why did God want Adam to name the animals? Couldn't God do that himself? Couldn't he do that himself? Certainly. Do you know why he wanted him to name the animals? Because to place a desire in his heart for a woman. I mean, as he saw these animals pass by, an animal with a long neck looks like a giraffe, doesn't it? What else? A skunk smells like a skunk. And then... What else do you call a hippopotamus but a hippopotamus? Then it dawned upon Adam, Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe, Mr. and Mrs. Hippopotamus, Mr. and Mrs. Skunk. There were two. There was male and female. And Adam looked around and he said, there's not one like me. Not at all. God created a desire in Adam's heart, but also he created a woman. A woman was designed by God. Now, woman means taken out of man. Biologically and psychologically, a woman is made different than a man. Did you know that? Did you know that? I, I, want, I want to clear that up. I want to make sure that you know there's a difference between a man and and a woman physically and emotionally. You got that? She is to be a responder and a completer. A responder and a completer. We have made a tragic mistake if we try to make men and women the same. Women are different than men. If you're sitting by your wife right now, how many of you are sitting by a wife? or by a woman, okay? Turn to that person next to you, if, if it's a different sex, okay? And just say to them, you're different than me. Okay, you got that. You got that. Now listen to this. Oh, the shrewdness of their shrewdness when they are shrewd. 
and their rudeness of their rudeness when they are rude. But the shrewdness of their shrewdness and the rudeness of their rudeness are as nothing to their goodness when they are good. Oh, the gladness of their gladness when they are glad, and the gladness and the sadness of their sadness when they are sad. But the gladness of their gladness and the sadness of their sadness are nothing to their badness when they are bad. A Persian poem goes like this. God took a rose, a lily, a dove, a serpent, a little honey, a dead sea apple, and a handful of clay. And then when he looked at the results, it was a woman. Here's the difference between a man and a woman. A man will pay $2 for a $1 item he wants. And a woman will pay $1 for two items she doesn't want. <laughs> we are different, aren't we? We are different. The unisex idea is born out of hell. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says this, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. God made man and woman. No woman needs to be liberated from femi femininity. God has made us different for a reason. One time, Santa and I were over in the gym, and uh, we were working out, and I said, Honey, don't get bowed up, because I want something to hug soft, not hard. If I want something to hug hard, I'll hug a man, but not, you know. God planned a bride, God provided a bride, and then God presented a bride to Adam. What a wedding that must have been. What a wedding. The place, Eden, a garden paradise. You know, men and women look out the world over for the right place to have a wedding. How long did y'all look to have, till you found your place? Huh? Three or four months. Listen to that. Three or four. Adam and Eve didn't have to look for anywhere. They had it. They had the beautiful place, a perfect place for their wedding. I wonder if God himself did not lead, lead Eve down the aisle, under the canopy of trees, through the path of field of flowers, under the canopy of the sky, under the sky. God gave Eve to Adam. And my friends, I don't have to wonder how Adam felt. Why, well, he even expressed it in Genesis 2, 23. When he saw Eve, he said, this is it. This is it. This is not a hippopotamus. This is not this. This is not that. This is it. To translate it in common terms today, it's this. Hot dog, this is it. Wow. I mean, Adam was excited. Now get this truth. God gave Eve to Adam to nourish and to cherish. Look with me to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 28. A beautiful passage. Ephesians 5, 28. It says this, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Listen to this. This mystery is profound. This mystery is is too deep to comprehend. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. 
Nourish means to build up, to give strength to. Cherish means to tenderly care for. Listen, my friends, marriage is a divine institution. It was inaugurated by God. It is sustained by God. Marriage is a divine institution. Matthew 19.6 says this, Wherefore they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Listen to this. It's not love that sustains a marriage. It's marriage that sustains love. Did you catch that? It's that commitment to that other person that sustains love. Because there are hard times and there are difficult times and there are times that you're going to go through that only that commitment to God and to that other mate will get you through that. Listen to me. God hates divorce. Those who are divorced would stand up here with me and testify as to the harm and the hurt and the damage it causes. But let me tell you, God is merciful and He does forgive. You, listen, if you're not married, you should pray very seriously about the one who you marry. Prayer could stop a lot of divorces. If you pray about it and God leads you to that one, I remember one guy in college saw this gorgeous gal. And he said, I'm going to marry that girl. And so he walked up to her one day and he said, God told me to marry you. And she looked at him and said, well, God hadn't told me. <laughs> but <laughs> it did happen. It did happen. God eventually spoke to her about that, and they uh, came together. You should pray very seriously about the one you marry. Here's another reality. God, doesn't, God does not intend everyone to marry. Not everyone to marry. In fact, Paul emphasized singleness as a, a motivation or as, as one who could serve God even more because they do not have uh, the weight of marriage and the family responsibility upon them. Paul talked about his singleness and serving the Lord without that. So God doesn't intend for everyone to get married. Our first point was marriage made in heaven. But there's a second point. A marriage marred by hell, or a marriage opposed by hell. Look at Genesis 3, 1. Genesis 3, 1. You know the story, but let's look at it again. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, uh, say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the, its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The devil hates the home. And he's leveled all of his opposition against the home. But what do we see in this passage? We see selfishness. Oh, how many homes today have been ruined by selfishness? The forbidden fruit of immorality, drugs, alcohol, pornography, and pride. 
have turned wedlock into deadlock. We also see shame. For when they did sin, they recognized that they were naked. Before they sinned, they had no sense of guilt or nakedness. They were clothed with the garments of light. Psalms 104.2 says this, Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. You say, how do you know they were transformed or they were covered by light? Well, let me give you a little clue. Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. This is what I think we're going to look like maybe in heaven that we will be transfigured, we will be beautiful, we will be covered with light. And then we see separation. Separation. First of all, there's accusation. Adam blamed God first. He said, that woman that you gave me. So he was blaming God. And then he also was blaming that woman. So I, here, here I, I see this picture. Adam said, it's the woman's fault. And then the woman said, it's the serpent's fault. And the serpent goes... <laughs> you know, he didn't have anybody to blame. I mean, we're good at the blame game, folks. I mean, it's somebody else's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my brother's fault. It's, it's this one. It's that one. There was separation. There was selfishness and shame and separation, but there was also sorrow. Sin always brings sorrow. Sin injures. Paradise lost. The Garden of Eden had been lost to Adam and Eve. The devil had lied to them. And we've seen marriages made in heaven. We've seen a marriage marred by hell. But there's a third thing, and I like this part. A marriage marked by hope. A marriage marked by hope. Look again with me to Genesis 2, 21 and 22. It says this, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it, up, up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Uh, I, want, I want to admit, admit something to you. Somewhere in my early age, I heard that man had one less rib than a woman. Somebody said that, and I believed it until I would talk to a doctor. And this doctor said, no, that's not the truth. In fact, the only way that you can tell a man's skeleton from a female skeleton is the pelvic girdle is larger. That's the only way. And that's for the birth canal. And man, I said, boy, I feel stupid. You know, I used to count ribs. And I used to go up to girls and say, can I count your ribs? You know. <laughs> I'm doing a survey. I'm seeing. Honestly, I, I, I did until I was a grown man, until a, a doctor corrected me. Adam was a type or picture of Jesus. Romans 5, 14 says that, this, Yet death reigneth over from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Adam in his perfect state was a type of Jesus who glorified God in his image. Eve is a type or picture of the church. She was taken from the wounded side of Adam. Jesus slept in a deep sleep of death and from his wounded side, the church was taken. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32 says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a mystery. This mystery is profound. 
And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. The word made actually means built. Just as God built the first woman, He is now building His church, the bride of Christ. One day, the church will be built. But right now, He's building it. He's adding stones to the church. And one day, that bride will be built. And on that day, that's going to be when the bride is presented to the heavenly bridegroom. And there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. The home is supposed to be a little bit of heaven. But in some cases, it's a lot of hell. God never intended and God never wanted that to happen. My friends, Jesus Christ is the only hope of your home. He is the only hope of your eternity. Last week, we're taking Sammy to the airport. And we were talking about several subjects. And some very serious subjects that we were mystified about, questioned about. And Sammy and I came to the conclusion that the only solution The only solution is Jesus. If Jesus is not sufficient for these situations, then we have no hope. We have no help. If that is the case, if if Jesus is not, both Sammy and I said, we need to quit preaching. We're, 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 We're harming people, not helping people. But Jesus is all sufficient in all things. Jesus is all powerful to overcome all things. Jesus is all knowing to lead us through all things. We see a society wrecked by all sorts of evil. And the only solution, my friends, is Jesus. While we will run to this person and to this place and read this thing and that thing, when our solution is Jesus Himself. To run into the loving arms of Jesus and let Him help us. Let Him heal us. Let Him lead us. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is our only hope. Let me ask you this question today. Do you have that hope? Do you have that help? Well, you can. If you don't have it, you can have it. The Bible says that we're to repent, we're to turn from our selfish ways, our old self, and we're to turn to God. And then we are to receive from God eternal life. It's a gift from God. And so he says, turn away from your old self and come to me and receive the free gift of eternal life, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Have you received that gift? Have you received that gift? And if you have that gift, if you have Jesus, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, is He able to work in your life? He can help your home. He can help your life. He can help your career. He can help you. But will you let Him? Will you let Him? You know, sometimes I don't want to let Jesus help me. I mean, I can do it on my own, I think. But then, you know, Jesus lets me do it on my own. And guess what I am? A total failure. I make a terrible God. And this God can't, is not sufficient. I am not sufficient. But when I run into the arms of Jesus, He says, welcome. I love you. You're my creation. I want to help you. I want to guide you. I, wanna, I want you to follow me. And trust me. And 
when, I, when that happens, the road is smoother, the path is lighted, and the destination is clear. Do you know him? Do you trust him? Do you walk with him? Let's bow our heads for just a moment. If you've never met that, that one Jesus, if he is not all sufficient to you, why don't you open your hearts? Why don't you pray a prayer similar to this? Father, I know that I am a sinner. I know I need Jesus in my life. I turn from my selfish ways and I receive today the gift of eternal life, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for saving me. And Jesus, I want to follow you all the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. We're going to stand for just a moment and have a a time of commitment. If God is speaking to you in any way, maybe some of of you uh, husbands and wives just need to come down and recommit. Your, your marriage, your home to Him, ask God's strength. So I'll stand as we, we, uh, we do that. I'll ask our pianist to play a little bit here. And if God has spoke to you in any way today, I encourage you to step forward, to, to make a commitment. If husband and wife need to come, just come and kneel down and, and pray together for just a moment. Do what God wants you to do. Men, take that wife by the hand and come forward and recommit your home, your family, your marriage to Christ today. Recommit it. So we want to walk with you, Lord. Do that now. Please be seated for a moment as we continue our time of worship. Part of our worship is giving our tithes and offerings to our, uh, to our Lord, and we ask that our offering takers come forward. Josh, would you ask the Lord's blessing on our offering? Uh, bring back to you a little part of what you have brought us. Let us give us uh, with joyful hearts and just be remembering that everything that we owe is not ours but yours. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.
we found some keys it looks like to a Hyundai or something. It has on here um, cooking experience. If you don't claim your keys, I'm going to have a car this afternoon. Oh, no, I don't. I, they, we just found them out there, so uh, see me afterwards. Let's, uh, we need to make a, a few announcements. In your bulletin, you will see some wonderful announcements. And one of the big things that's happening in a couple of weeks is our ladies' conference on the 10th of October, Christ in You, the Hope of Glory. Now, Carmina will be outside selling tickets. We want you ladies to be a part of this. We've done this every other year. Beth Greer will be uh, with us again, and uh, she's a wonderful communicator, uh, precious lady. We want you to be a part of that. So see uh, Carmina afterwards. Another thing that we want to mention to you, if any of you want the book, the story, and whatever, if you a little late in starting, I'll be out there at, uh, also with the books. And then uh, this afternoon, we started Friday night, what we call Friday Night Lights or Marriage Makeover. And we had a great time. We just had a wonderful time. And uh, if, if you would like to do that, uh, I'm going to have a makeup uh, of the Marriage Makeover uh, this afternoon at 5 o'clock. And if you would like to come... Just see me so we will have the material. You're welcome to come. There's no cost. Uh, you can come and participate. This, uh, we have the, this guy that, uh, that teaches us, Kevin Lehman, is just hilarious. He brings the point home through his humor. And then I believe that Sally has an announcement. Is that correct? Sally, would you come? Sure. Sure. Thanks. In the bulletins, we put a little flyer of an event for men, October 24th. It will be in Spanish. It's called La Imagen de un Verdadero Hombre. There are three of our own uh, church members who will be speakers at this, but it, there are also some other really very, very good speakers. You will be blessed. It's only for men. It's all day, October 24th, in Spanish. There will be no translation into English. I'm sorry. Um, it's conferences. For men, for those of you that like football, we're starting off the day with uh, Chiqui Marco, el uh, arbitro Marco Antonio Rodriguez. He's an incredible speaker, and he loves the Lord. So it will be a great, really uh, a great day. It does have a cost, but really you will, it's literally, I don't know how do you say it in English, costo de recuperación. So if you want to come, uh, talk to me, or if you're in the Spanish congregation, talk to Paola or you can also sign up. The information is on the flyer. Thank you very much. October 24th. Very wonderful. Only men, no women. No women. No men. Okay. Uh, if you brought your uh, mission money, uh, we take it up at the last deal. You can bring it here. Here's one right here. That's not mine. It's somebody else's. Here's mine. Now, I have some extra boxes if, uh, you, don't, if you don't have a box. And those of you that forgot your box, we only distributed about a hundred of these, but um, uh, we try to remind you with our emails that uh, we have this. This is my box. It's still got the screw in. It's not as much as the other one. <laughs> oh, by the way, somebody, if anybody would like a, a box, don't take my box. Hey, here's a cute little one right here. Somebody donated. It's got uh, Garfield on it. You can have that one. There are four of them up here that you can get. Uh, somebody, come here, guys. Here, a place in there. Somebody put a Chuck E. Cheese uh, uh, coin in there. <laughs> I think I'm going to go eat on Jesus, you know. <laughs> eat on missions here. Okay. If you didn't uh, bring uh, your chains or anything, you can pass by here and drop it in, in here. And uh, um, I'm going to keep Chuck and Chuck. No, I'm not. Um, let's all stand. We're going to sing and, and be dismissed. So come on, let's sing. If you want a, you want a box, uh, you can come up here. Where the people of God, called by his name, called from the dark and delivered from shame, 
one holy race saints everyone because of the blood of Christ as people of the light. May God's peace be with you.